past few years, the amount of Wario games have never been short. Some have been good, others have been bad. But then there are rare cases that we remember and never stop talking about. Such examples are Space Marine and Dawn of War. But what made those games reach a spot where others fail? Well today, I'm going to tell you. In order for a Warhammer game to be considered one of the best, it must do three things. Please the new player, the gamer, and the veteran. The new player is someone new to the IP and the world of Warhammer. The story and the lore must not be too overwhelming to keep that type of player interested all through the game, leading to them hopefully wanting to learn more about the universe and the other games available. The gamer is someone who knows nothing of Warhammer, but also does not want to but instead is looking for a good gaming experience for whatever type of game they are playing. It must show that it has good art direction, sound design, no scummy microtransactions, but also caters for the different type of players, the ones looking for a fun, easy experience, and your more hardcore players looking for a challenge. The last is the veteran. These are the people that worship Warhammer as a cult and are the hardest ones to please, and is the true final boss of a game when being considered one of the best. In the game there must be lore and story that pleases these hardcore fans, and the game mechanics must not divvy away from too much from what these people consider realistic. From the moment I understood the weakness of my flesh, it disgusted me. I craved the strength and certainty of steel. <laughs> Sorry, it looks quite it looks fucking so ridiculous. Stupid. Does anyone see my poster? I'm a bit shy. Yes, I know I'm late. Warhammer 40,000 Mechanicus. What is it? Warhammer 40,000 Mechanicus is a turn based tactical game. No! but you take control of different units and abilities trying to outsmart an AI that also has units and abilities. That's the front cover, but there's a lot more depth within. The game has been developed by Bulwark Studios, and the only other game they made was Crown Takers. This must have been quite a step up for them because Crown Takers seems like a mobile game, but it's turn-based, so I can see where they got some of their ideas from. I feel it's important to explain the story and lore of Warhammer 40k Mechanicus before I judge the other stuff. You play as the Adeptus Mechanicus, of course, guys that live on Mars, and the intro gives you a pretty good insight into how they think. One day, the crude biomass that you call the temple will wither. If you did not get that, basically the only thing you need to know is that the flesh is weak, the machine is strong. These guys are always looking to learn and love technology. That's one of the reasons why you may see one fucking a toaster at some point in a meme by the Warhammer community. Not one of my proudest moments. The story is based around a group of tech priests, which is what they are referred to. They are searching for missing technology they can salvage and learn from in the Milky Way galaxy, and they stumble across a planet that might have what they are looking for. Obviously, this game needs an enemy, so when searching the planet, they wake up the antagonist. Enters the Necrons. The Necrons, to put it simply, are the undead race of 40k, and they love Warpstone. Wait, wrong setting. They are basically metal, self-repairing, undying machines that went to sleep a long time ago on many different planets. Obviously more lore there, but you don't need to know that. The main plot is that this planet with all these Necrons is waking up, and it's your job to steal as much as you can, keep them asleep, and in the end stop this. For new players, this is great. The story is so simple to follow, and you don't need to be a lore expert to play. But the beauty of this is that for a new player, it's a great introduction to the Warhammer IP. You see all the cool, futuristic looking assets and environments, and I can imagine it makes one want to know more about what they are playing. But this is one of those things that sets this game apart from many other Warhammer games. Whilst the tip of the iceberg of the story is simple for a new player, the depth this game goes into to please its lore-hungry Warhammer fans is nothing short of amazing. 
For example, the tech priests will consistently judge each other's decisions, and you can see this conflict each of them have. Some talk more in binary code, some characters want to study the Necron's weapons and structures, whilst others see this as heresy. It's really interesting to see this interaction they have with the dialogue. They also mention the Machine God or the Omnisire on many occasions, showing that they are faithful to their god. Combine this with how they interact in missions failing or succeeding, and when they see new Necrons in battle, you really feel like you are watching how the Adeptus Mechanicus would be after reading the law. If you love the Necrons, they do their law justice. There are many times they make references back to the war in heavens and being betrayed by the sun god, tricking their souls into these immortal machines. Also, you never see two Necrons interacting with each other. It's always one of the bosses talking to the tech priests, and they truly make you feel insignificant to them. They always refer to you as insects, that the Imperium of Man is purely a bleep in the universe that will be forgotten, and that the Indectus Mechanicus is a disgrace to machines. From the books I've read of the Necrons, I'm amazed at how well they captured their personality of how they interact with other races. Back to the story, while searching these tombs, you encounter different Necrons waking up, leading to boss battles with lords which represent different parts of the planet and environments, eventually leading to a battle with the Overlord being the final boss. After you defeat the Overlord, all the Necrons on the planet revert back to their defence protocols, making them easy prey. At the end of the story, there is a conflict about whether to loot the planet's technology or not, teasing the Heretech expansion, which I will talk about later. This is really good story writing for a Warhammer game. The new player understands they are fighting undead skeleton robots and playing as tech-hungry machine-worshipping priests. But for a veteran, you notice all the minor details that a new player would miss when they are referencing lore and the tabletop game. It's a great balance, and one that doesn't make the new player feel overwhelmed, but also the veteran feels they're getting their Warhammer kick. The gameplay of Mechanicus is split into three parts. The preparing, the exploring, and the fighting. I will cover each in detail. The way Mechanicus is set out is that your five story characters will have missions for you to complete, taking place on different parts of the planet. Each mission will be a different experience in a different environment, and it will tell you the difficulty, the enemies you can encounter unless you've seen them already, and the loot you will gain from that mission if successful. The difficulty levels for the missions can go easy, normal, hard, and praise the Omnisire. What? You know shit's going down when there's a difficulty level named after a god. However, this is for the overall amount of enemies and different types and the objective you will be facing in that mission. There are a lot of other ways this game can become hard through its game mechanics, which I will touch on later. You can prepare for missions in two ways. First is your tech priests, which you will have two of when starting the game, that you can customise for battle. You have disciplines, well, let's just call them skill trees, that you can use a currency called Blackstone, which you gain in a number of ways to upgrade these. They allow you to customise your tech priest into a playstyle that fits you. Do you want a tech priest to be good at melee combat? Well, you can do that. How about buff troops or other tech priests? That is something you can do. You can also create hybrids if you want a mixed bag of disciplines, but as you go through the game, you will learn which ones are most important to get for all your characters, such as Extraction Protocol Servo Skull, Enhanced Weapons, and Escape. Also, an important note is that once you've spent the Blackstone, you can't refund it, but later in the game, this becomes less of a problem. When you level up your disciplines, you will also get torso, head, arm, and leg augmentations based on the one you pick, so four for each. This brings me on to the second part of customizing your Tech Priest, STC Fragments. Let's just change that word to Equipment. Picking your equipment for missions is fun as there are a lot of things to consider. Some ranged weapons are better at area of effect or shooting one enemy. Melee weapons however all act the same with no difference as they always target one enemy, which is disappointing, but this is made up when picking a weapon's machine spirit and cognition cost. All of that will be covered in gameplay mechanics. You will also have to consider augment cost, which is how much space your tech priest has. Better equipment requires more augment spots and you'll get one with each discipline level. When you first start, you can equip very little, but as you level up, your tech priest will start looking like Dr. Octopus. Wait, wait. where are the arms? Oh wow, so cool. Your kind claim to your flesh, as if it will not decay and fail you. One day, the crude biomass that you call the temple will wither. I craved the strength and certainty of steel. Amazing. 
I aspired to the purity of the blessed machine. The support equipment focuses around either buffing you or debuffing your enemy. This can be buffing your damage, reducing the enemy's chance to hit you, and my personal favourite, becoming a self-healing monster. In total, there are 10 of these to choose from, with others being more upgraded versions of the minor ones. For example, this Omnispex means that an enemy has a 50% chance to miss me. The upgraded version gives 75%. One thing I feel a lot of people who review this game don't mention is the time the devs put into these equipment and weapons, as they're not made up. And people overlook this. A lot of these are from the tabletop and stratagems of the Adeptus Mechanicus Codex, so it's nice to see that devs really put passion into learning each weapon and what each part of a tech priest does. Anyway, the second way you can prepare for a mission is with your cohort. Now, these are units you will unlock when completing missions throughout the campaign, but to keep it simple for now, when selecting a mission, you can choose units you want to bring with you, costing Blackstone. Each will bring its own advantages and disadvantages to the battlefield when dealing with certain enemies. There is a lot more to talk about there, but I need this to be structured and everything will be covered in time. As you head into a mission, you will be taken to a holographic display of the tomb showing your units. You will move through different rooms that have different effects on the group. Some are good, others are bad. A lot of these decisions will affect the dialogue by the characters, but more importantly they will affect the rooms you will fight enemies in. You will soon reach rooms that have your main objective in, and there can be multiple ones depending on the mission. Once you complete your objective, the game will take you back to the ship to rinse and repeat those three steps until you fight the final boss where the game ends. Right, let's get into those details. The first game mechanics you will be introduced to is the Awakening Meter. There are two of these, the Awakening Process on the planet and the one within the tombs. The way this works is that every time you go into a mission, search tombs or rounds in battles, this will increase the Awakening Meter in that mission. This will do a number of things. First of all, it will increase the number of Necrons you will fight in battle, their initiative, which means they get to move first, and how fast their reanimation protocol is. The longer time spent in that mission, the harder and harder the mission will become, stimulating the Necrons waking up up and becoming more powerful. When shit hits level 7, you better pray to that goddamn Omnissiah. Once the mission is done, depending on how many tiers of the Awakening Meter you have, this will increase the overall Awakening Meter on the planet. This is where the game allows for different playthroughs as this acts as a timer. Once it reaches 100%, all other missions will be gone, forcing you into that final battle. This is a brilliant mechanic, as you always feel against the clock, and if you don't play smart in the campaign, you will lose out on potential gear and new units for your cohort. But from a lore perspective, I love this, as it feels like I'm truly in a Necrom tomb that's waking up. And I don't think that could be better transformed into game format. The exploring part, I feel, is where this game shines, as if it was just the combat, I think it would be lacking something. The exploring is a Warhammer's fan's wet dream, as it combines lore, decision making and risk and reward gameplay. In the tomb, there are five different rooms you will come across, treasure rooms, encounter rooms, enemies, main objective and just nothing. When you move between rooms, the awakening meter will go up by two bars. I can understand now why the tech priests are moving so fast. Guys, seriously, I don't have my little spider eggs like you. I mean, I've got to carry the missus around with me as well. She's in fucking labor. That's crazy. Encounter rooms being the most interesting out of all of them is where the game separates the new players from the lore experts. When you go into these rooms, a prompt will come up on the screen describing a situation, and will provide you with three choices. The situations can be anything from traps, finding other Skatari dead or in a gunfight, hallucinating, hearing enemies up ahead, gas-filled rooms, repairing equipment, investigating Necron architecture, it's endless. This plays a lot like Dungeons and Dragons, but the work here is incredible because each environment is tied to its own situations. For example, the environment that contains flayed ones, the Necrons that wear flesh, has situations around Sektari being stripped of their flesh, being tortured, and bloodstains. And the grim dark is definitely there. Holy Emperor, my word. Someone forgot their tampon? The choices you have are ways you can deal with the encounter. If you know traps are ahead, do you find another route, or send someone ahead to set off the traps? Or if you find a Necron altar, do you destroy it or investigate? When you make a choice, a few things may happen. First of all is the Awakened Meter. Any choice that requires the party to take more time will increase this, like praying, fixing or finding another route. The next is the health of the party. If you send someone ahead to investigate or set off a trap, they will take damage, but you will save time. 
However, they're not all negative effects if you make the right choice. Some will give you more Blackstone, which is one of the ways you can obtain it, Cognition Points, which we will get to, Health for the party, and lastly, Gear. It was rare to find equipment in the tombs, but it makes it all the more better when you do find some. This mechanic works like a charm, and combining this D&D adventure style decision making with combat is brilliant. And if you're a lore expert, you will understand what the smarter decisions are compared to the new player who might just pick the first thing in their head. Treasure rooms are simple. The prompt says there's a locked door, vault, whatever it may be, and you need to pick the right symbol. This was a kind of basic mechanic and it just becomes a guessing game, however someone did do the research to find what every symbol means, but if you're like me and don't see this you would just pick at random. The rewards can be STC templates or equipment, blackstone, cognition points, reducing the awakening meter and gaining health. Vice versa though, you can get negative effects, but if you pick the right one enough it will glow green and if you pick the wrong one enough it will glow red. Personally, I feel like this mechanic could have been a bit better, perhaps a hard minigame or a Warhammer 40k trivia. What I feel could have been a good idea is if you chose to fight the Necrons before exploring, you gain knowledge from them and then you know which glyphs are the right to press. It's just there's no smart way of playing this. You pick the symbol and pray to the Omnicide that you get something good. We next have rooms with enemies in and these are no different to main objectives but you don't have to do them. But they can be useful to go into because you can lower your awakening meter and also gain more blackstone. Lastly, we have the rooms with your objective in, and there can be multiple of these in a mission. Your objectives usually come down to two things, kill all enemies and scanning or destroying these control panels. When you scan them, you get blackstone, and when you destroy them, they reduce your awakening meter. Once this is done, you are asked to either escape or kill all enemies. The objectives are simple, and that's not a bad idea when you take into consideration all the other things. Cognition points are the asymmetric mechanic of the game. They allow you to deploy units, use weapons and abilities. You can get them in and out of battle as I've said before and it's a clever mechanic as it prevents people rushing to their main objective in the tombs as you'll want cognition points when fighting. At the bottom of your screen it will show you how many you have and more powerful units and abilities will require more cognition points. Well in battle you can get cognition points by either going up to one of the cognition generators in the area and absorbing them or if you have a servo skull upgrade you can scan for them. You also get them when putting enemies into their down state and being close enough to get them. This mechanic balances out the gunplay, making you choose those moments to use your more powerful abilities and weapons. Some Necrons also have abilities that can steal these, so you have to think about what you're doing. The combat starts with you deploying your units. Tech Priests are always free, but other units cost CP, encouraging you to think about when to bring them into the battle. When deployed, you will see the initiative phases, seeing which units will move first. Obviously, if you've been in the tombs too long and the awakening meter is high, Necrons will move first. Everyone takes a turn and there's a lot of things you can do in your turn, move, shoot, then move again, use an ability. The combat system has no cover system other than line of sight and this works well as I don't think a cover system would fit this game when you have all the healing and defensive abilities already. Once everyone has had a turn, the round ends and restarts. This will increase the awakening meter by one, reset the CP generators and allow you to call in reinforcements. Each side has its own race mechanics that fit well into the lore, tabletop and gameplay. The Adeptus Mechanicus have canticles and machine spirits. Canticles are the Adeptus hymns like you would sing in church, which are something you pick before a match that you gain after completing levels. And this is such a brilliant idea. Take a small piece of lore or tabletop gameplay like canticles and turn them into a full flesh mechanic in the game. These are basically your get out of jail free cards as they provide powerful abilities without the need of cognition points, but you can only use them once during an entire mission, so you have to choose wisely. These can be healing up units to full HP, dealing more damage with the next weapon you use, etc. The machine spirit is something I've always loved seeing in Warhammer games, as I found the lore around a machine god giving its blessings on weapons and vehicles to do more damage or be faster really interesting. Every weapon in the game has a machine spirit. It will activate once you fire the gun a few times, being showed by the red bar. The machine spirit is the special trait the weapon has. When looking at your infantry, you can see this. In combat, there are three different types of damage. These are physical, energy and just normal damage that fits into both categories. The way damage works is a weapon will have a damage number and a type. The target will either have a physical or energy resistance or nothing at all. 
when you shoot a weapon, it has a chance to deal a certain amount of damage. For example, let's say between 5 and 10, it hits with 8 energy damage. If the target has a resistance to that damage by 2 energy, it will reduce the hit to 6. Whilst damage has its random numbers, it feels far from a luck game, and positioning yourself into the right position with the right weapon does require skill. There are also critical hits that deal maximum damage, and also don't allow for the reanimation protocol, which brings me on to the Necron race mechanics. The Necrons all have ways to buff themselves and heal, but the one that really pleases the tabletop players is the reanimation protocol, and that shit is scary on the tabletop. The way this works in game is once you've reduced the health of a Necron to zero, they will collapse and a round timer will start. This is where the Awaken meter is most noticeable, because the higher it is, the less rounds it takes for a Necron to reanimate. For example, on 7, they reanimate instantly. When in the down state, you must attack them one more time to finish them off. I love this mechanic. It's what made the Necrons in Dark Crusade, so I'm glad it works here as well. The mechanics and the gameplay of this game intertwine with each other perfectly, and I don't think you could get a better Warhammer 40k turn-based game that shows the Adeptus Mechanicus and the Necrons battling in the grim, dark future. My playthrough of the game was simple and I'll keep it short. I first started out with one tech priest being a melee tank and the other being an AoE killer. This worked well until I ran into the Lich Guard, but I realised they could be countered with the levelled up Skatari Rangers. I completed the game but realised I had a lot left to unlock so decided to go back and complete some more missions and then do the final boss again, which was no different and every ending is the same. But then I noticed I had missing achievements and thought, I wonder what those are. At the same time, me and a friend were comparing Mechanicus to XCOM and discussing the differences and he was saying that XCOM was a harder experience. I then looked at the achievements and thought, how hard can this be? And gave it a try. Do note, up to this point, I was playing on medium as I feel it's best to play the game the way the devs intended. I selected very hard, ticked Iron Man, Permadeath and the worst of all, I skipped the tutorial and pressed new game. Yeah, I didn't get very far. On the plus side though, you do get another cutscene showing the ending where the Necrons win, but that's about it. But this did show me that this can be on par with XCOM if not harder when it comes to difficulty level, but comparing these two games is heresy and they're vastly different in how they play. The environments of this game truly set the Warhammer 40k theme. From the moving platforms of unknown technology to the strange Necron looking structures, you feel like you are in a Necron tomb. One thing this game does that is really hard to pull off is make the movement squares fit into the environments. As most games, it looks weird having these squares everywhere, but in Mechanicus, it works so, so well with the environments and you really don't notice them. There are five environments on the planet and they all fit a theme. Some have more technology with floating platforms, whilst others have decayed human skin in the environment, adding to that grim dark feel. What really brings out the environments more are the effects. The use of fog, lighting and shadows helps to sell this organic environment. But then when you combine this with the effects of the guns and abilities, the colours really complement each other, with the blue of the tech priest weapons against the green environment. I assume that's another reason why the UI is blue, as you can clearly see what you're looking at. When playing this game, it did start to give me memories of Dawn of War 3's environments and effects. So why does it look so good here? This one was really bugging me because I hated Dawn of War Freeze effects and I felt like there must be a reason why this game is more appealing. I think it's because since this game is turn based, you can take in everything that's going on. The guns shooting once at a time and the environment effects are easy to see, but if this game was like Dawn of War being real time, I think it would be too much. It does make me wonder if Dawn of War Freeze effects were the right choice, but not for the game. You'll have to let me know in the comments.
I can't put to words of how amazing the music is in this game. And just saying it's great doesn't even comprehend it. I mean, you know a soundtrack is good when people listen to the music for reading, playing and painting. And the jokes as well are brilliant. Played this on Sunday in my church. All the monks are tech priests now. I played this at McDonald's and the ice cream machine worked. The fact as well that this soundtrack was composed by three people is shocking. And what frustrates me more is that it probably didn't even win an award for this. Just plain heresy. It just shows how the gaming industry can be, since this rivals the best gaming soundtracks out there. When playing, this music sings. The use of organs screams Adeptus Mechanicus, and each soundtrack fits perfectly into each situation, from being on the menu screen to fighting a boss. I'm surprised the tech priests don't actually start dancing to this whilst waiting for their turn. I still can't believe I did that, fuck me. The sound effects are the cherry on top of the music. From enemies dying, to cognition points, to weapons shooting and necrons moving, it's breathtaking. What amazes me is that every ability has a different sound, none are used twice. I even take a break from the gameplay just to listen to the different button noises. Even if you don't want to play Mechanicus, just listening to the soundtrack is worth it. The voice acting is an interesting approach, as of course the tech priests would not even talk to each other and would just transfer information, so trying to make that engaging to the player is a challenge, and the way they do this is by making them sound nothing like humans. And they could have been lazy and just done text to speech. If I still had my stomach, I would be regurgitating bile. But they went the extra mile and made them sound like nothing I've heard before, which made me actually want to listen. The Necrons are amazing, the slow deep voice and echoes really fits their personality, and they also gave each Lord a different voice, and they could have just been lazy and just done one for all of them, but getting 5 voice actors was definitely a good decision. Also, after playing this, I think I can do a pretty good Necron voice. Welcome to my tomb. Fuck me, my poor sack is really itchy after being asleep so long. Where are the scarabs when you need them? And that is with no pitch control, believe it or not. Anyway... Both the Necrons and the Adeptus Mechanicus models are low poly count, but it works. The use of normal mapping and effects seems like there's a lot more details on the guns and robes than there actually are. And for the Necrons, which I feel had more work done on them, they look great. Once again, I'm going to reference Dawn of War 3, as I feel this is what that game's assets should have looked like, as the effects are still there, but they don't overwhelm the screen, and they just look more grim dark overall. The animations of each models fit perfectly with the sound, and they also were animated really well. You could see that the animation team and the sound team worked really close together when doing this as everything lines up perfectly. From shooting to moving and using abilities to being idle, everything is smooth, so really well done to the animation team for pulling this off. When it comes to the models themselves in the game, I'm quite intrigued because first of all, this game only came out a few months after the Forge Bane box set, so they must have planned these two together. But more importantly, there were some Necrons in this game I'd never seen before, such as the boss Neft Tusk, and this was hinting towards maybe the new Necron range with them having more spider-like legs than hovering, but who really knows on that one. However, it always excited me in this game to see a new Necron enemy, and it was definitely one of the things that kept me coming back and playing. I do wish though that there was an archive where you could view all the Necrons you encountered, as I would have liked to have seen all of them and see the work gone in. The UI is adequate, you see everything you need to and it does not overcrowd the screen which is definitely a plus, and also the choice of colours with the blue over the green definitely allows for everything to be seen better. 
it's easy to see your cognition points, passive abilities, how far you will shoot and move, etc. And overall, it does a good job. The settings for the game are minimal and you can't change the graphics settings very much, but I think this is not a bad idea as trying to make a game like this playable for low end computers is definitely a good idea. I also liked that they gave you the option to change the difficulty level any time during a campaign, as for new players it would definitely help to keep them playing if they find the game too hard and know they can switch at any time. The Heretic DLC adds to the story of a group of tech priests becoming a rogue faction. And I did not play the Heretic DLC as I don't think it's a good idea to review a game combined with its DLC, because DLC is very subjective and everyone has their own preferences. The Heretic DLC adds 5 new missions taking place in the Ark, new weapons and troops to command, and basically enemy tech priests to fight. Whilst the idea of this expansion sounded appealing to me of tech priests going rogue, I read other reviews of the DLC and as soon as I saw you have to play through the main game again, I passed. Maybe I will give it a go in the future, but for now I'll wait when I want to play Mechanicus again in a few months time. Overall, I experienced one bug when playing Mechanicus and it was on my second playthrough of the game. On the final boss mission, only one of the bosses spawned and I don't know why, but it was a minor bug and really you wouldn't notice unless you've played the game twice. I did find one exploit in the game, it's not game breaking but it did feel cheap, though I was playing on medium difficulty. The Castellan robots are super broken on medium difficulty and if you combine this with the reinforcements ability you can rush bosses with the burn damage and even on the final boss it ignores all armour so you don't have to destroy any of the beams. Mechanicus is nothing short of an amazing experience. At the start of this video, you would have seen what I look for in a game, which is pleasing three different types of people being the new player, gamer, and veteran. It 100% pleases all these types of players. And the fact it was such a small team making a game to triple A quality with an indie dev price tag is exceptional. Mechanicus gets a final verdict of 10 out of 10 and it is one for the book of honors now it would get a 9 out of 10 but what gives it the extra point is for the developers trying something new so many warhammer 40k games use the same races stories and mechanics mechanicus says no and gave a spotlight to two amazing races and a story that is a different narrative to what we've previously seen Mechanicus is 100% going to get a sequel. For anyone who knows how Games Workshop does their video games will know that I'm right as it fits the criteria. Mechanicus 2 could explore a lot of possibilities but that video is for another time. Thank you very much for watching and join me on my crusade as I review every Warhammer game ever made.